Today I'm going to be reading from Luke 28 uh, through 35. Luke 28, 35. Where I say to you, among those born of women, there is not greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard him, even the tax collectors, justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, having not been baptized by him. The Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting at the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned you, we mourned to you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said, He has he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine viper, the friend of a tax collector and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Good morning. Grateful for the presence of each and every one. Let me go ahead and put that up there. I meant to do that earlier and I forgot. Grateful for the presence of each and every one. If you are visiting with us, we are especially grateful for your presence. And we hope that you'll come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity. We will be meeting tonight at 5 o'clock. I started to say 6. 5 o'clock. We'll have uh, a second sermon beginning the first Sunday of the month. Uh, normally at that time we have Bible classes, but on the first Sunday of the month we have a second worship service. So we'll be doing that tonight. Wednesdays we meet at 7. This coming Wednesday will be our singing night, the first Wednesday of the month. Uh, and, then the, and then we go back to Bible classes there. We have Bible classes for all ages. Come and bring your children, get them enrolled in a class that's appropriate for their age, and study the Bible with us. My daddy used to have a saying. He said, what did the monkey say when the lawnmower ran over his tail? And the answer is, it won't be long now. <laughs> and it won't be long now until your old preacher is out of here and you'll be getting looking for a new preacher. And so uh, I'll have a lesson next Sunday be my last sermon. Of course, I'll be here the following Wednesday for class. But next Sunday will be my last sermon. Uh, and we'll be talking about what I leave behind. It'll be a text from... Uh, Acts chapter 20, when Paul talked to the elders at Ephesus. So I thought I'd say that in advance, let you know about that. If I can hold it together for that sermon, you know how I am. I get a little emotional sometimes, but if I can hold it together, that's what we'll be talking about, what I leave behind. Today we want to talk about preachers, the man and the message. The text here is very interesting. Uh, starting in verse 28, Jesus is speaking here, and he talks about the greatness of John the Baptist. He says, For I say to you, that among those born of women there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Boy, that's high praise, isn't it? Isn't it? Think of that. Greater than Isaiah, greater than Jeremiah, greater than Daniel. Uh, and that's exactly what he says here. There has not a, been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The kingdom of God was about to come, and that would put us in a greater position than even John the Baptist. So that's interesting. It's high praise for John, but it's even higher praise for you and I who are now enjoying the benefits and the blessings of the kingdom of God. And it says, verse 29, when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of, God, of John. The sinners, the tax collectors, the, the low lives, as the people regarded them, they were accepting the truth, they were accepting the gospel, they were being baptized uh, with the baptism of John. But, verse 30, the Pharisees and the lawyers, the uh, allegedly religious people, rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by Him. They rejected the message, they rejected the will of God. Uh, and Jesus has an interesting little take on this in verse 31 and following. He says, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? What are they like? He's talking specifically about those who reject the message, you see. He says, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all 
her children. I want you to think about that little parable or that little illustration. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. He's talking about the games that children played at that day and time. He says, like children sitting in the marketplace and they're calling one another and they say, well, let's play a game. Okay, well, let's play the game. Uh, uh, let's dance. And so we played the flute and you didn't dance. Well, let's change games then. Let's go the other direction. Let's play funeral. And so we mourn to you and, and you did not weep. And the ideal is we just can't please you no matter what we do. You cannot please these people. No matter what you do, uh, no matter how you react, no matter what you try, these people cannot be satisfied. They won't go along. They won't listen, you see. And that, that brings us back there to verse 30. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God. You couldn't please them. And then notice the application he makes of that in verse 33. Between John and Jesus. You see, there was a difference in the men. There was a difference between the men. The man behind the message were the two different men, Jesus and John, two totally different individuals. John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, he has a demon. So John, was a, he was a Nazarite, most scholars believe, and so he was a little austere. He didn't engage in some of the things that the rest of the world engaged in. And so he came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you said, he has a demon. Couldn't please. John wouldn't please him. Didn't like John, you see. But the Son of Man, Jesus, he comes... And he tries to fit in. He came eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber. Now, Jesus was neither one, by the way. Jesus was not a glutton. And Jesus was not a wine-bibber. But that was the accusation. He tries to fit in. In other words, John couldn't please him. And even Jesus couldn't please him, you see. And so they accused Jesus of being a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus says wisdom is justified by her children. You'll see the fruits of the message, and that's where the real wisdom is seen. It's not in the man, but it's in the message you see. And that's something for you to think about. As I've, I've, in fact, this just occurred to me. Uh, something for you to think about as you think about selecting a preacher to take my place. We get focused and caught up in the man. We get focused and caught up in the messenger and not in the message. And that's what this lesson is all about. I want you to think about different kinds of preachers in the New Testament. They were all different, just like people today are different. You know, and I've heard people say this before, you know, we'll have a gospel meeting. And people come out and say, well, he did a good job, but he ain't you, Lanny. I've heard that, you know. And, and, and I want you to think about that for a second. We get caught up in the man instead of the message. And it goes both ways, you see. It goes in every direction. And so I want you to think about every preacher is different. The next preacher that fills this pulpit is not going to be Lanny Smith. And that's okay. He's not going to be, every preacher is different. Everyone is different. We can't get caught up in the man. We have to think about the message. And so let's think about four examples. We could probably expand on this, but four different kinds of preachers that we find in the Bible. And consider the man versus the message with me this morning. First of all, let's talk about that John the Baptist, the harsh hermit. That's who John was. He was the harsh hermit. And you think about this man. He was not a very appealing individual when you just looked at him. You know, you just look at John and say, well, I don't know if I want that guy preaching for me or not. Let's just take an example over here in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. In the first three verses, the Bible says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, that's the same message Jesus preached. Uh, in chapter 4 was exactly the same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his, make his path straight. Now, let me tell you something. If you're the kind of person who doesn't like to travel a long way for worship, you would not have liked to go hear John, you see, because you wouldn't find John in the synagogues in town. John, that's not where John preached. He didn't preach in the local synagogues and all the towns in all the major cities in the nation of Israel. He was out in the wilderness. Oh, I heard about this great preacher, John the Baptist. Well, which synagogues? Yeah, he he's not in synagogue. He's out there. And, well, we got to go 15, 20 miles out in the wilderness to hear John? What are you talking about? And so if you, if you don't like to travel far to worship, now nowadays... Uh, people have the convenience of automobiles. You know, we can get in the car and we can be there in pretty short order and be there in pretty comfortable conditions, you know, with air conditioning and heat in our cars. And, uh, and, and so it's not such a big deal. But in Bible times, it was a pretty big deal to have to travel several miles to go hear somebody to preach. And if, if you didn't like to travel very far to worship, you would not have liked to hear John. 
I don't want to hear that guy. He's got, this, he's got the message of God, by the way. Don't forget that. He's preaching the truth. He's preaching the message of God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he's just not that appealing because I have to go too far to hear him. But I want you to think of something else in verse 4. If you're the kind of person who judges people by the way they dress or by the food that they eat, you would not have liked John at all. Look here at verse 4. John himself was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, I might be able to go for the honey, but I don't know about those locusts. Ugh. Do you see what that man eats? Do you see what kind of preacher is that that would just eat locusts and wild honey? Who is this guy? And so if you judge people by the way that, see, John the Baptist didn't wear a suit and tie. You go to hear John. Well, I've traveled 20 miles to hear John the Baptist. I expect to see him all dressed up in a suit and tie. Nope, nope, sorry. Camel's hair. Camel's hair. Probably had long hair. Probably had a scraggly beard, you see. This is John. He's the harsh hermit. He lived out there in the wilderness. And, and you're going to hear him. That's what you're going to see. And so you can't get caught up on the man. It's the message that's important, you see. And, and so if you're that kind of person who judges a person by the way they dress or the food that they eat, you wouldn't have liked John at all. Now, hold your spot right here because we're coming back to this. But flip over with me to James chapter 2 just for a second. Because I, I, I've said that twice, judging people by the way they dress. Look at this in James 2. In verses 1 through 4. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, there's John. There's John right there. A poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say, oh, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, poor John, oh, you stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Isn't that something to think about? Now, we sometimes we apply that to other things, but apply it right here. If you're the kind of person who judges preachers by the way they dress, by the way they look, by the appearance, you wouldn't like John at all. You wouldn't go listen to John at all, and you have to travel too far to hear him in the first place. Now, let's go back there to Matthew 3. Let's notice something else. If you don't like the kind of preaching that exposes sin for what it is, and calls upon people to repent, you would not have liked John. Look at his preaching here in verses 5 through 12. It says, Jerusalem and all Judea and the region around Jordan went out to him. So John was able to draw a crowd even though he's out there in the wilderness. And all were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Oh, I've got to be good to you because I don't want to run you off. That's not what he said, is it? That's not what he said. He said, You brood of vipers! Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's quite a greeting, isn't it? I go all the way out there to hear John, and that's what he says to me? That's exactly what he said. And that's the message of God. Don't forget, this is God's messenger here. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't come out here pretending, I want to see some real change in your life. Don't think to yourselves to say, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Big deal, I don't care who your pappy was. It doesn't make any difference to me. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Judgment is coming. It's imminent, you see. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. A fiery message. A message that a lot of people would not find welcoming. A message that a lot of people would find a little harsh, a little cold, a little cruel. And so if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to hear that kind of preaching, you wouldn't have liked John the Baptist at all. You, oh, no, I'm not going to listen to that guy. But listen to me carefully. The man behind the message, regardless of what John looked like, regardless of how harsh he preached, regardless of the kind of food John ate, that was irrelevant. What was relevant was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get yourselves ready. Judgment is coming. There's going to be a sifting and a separation between the righteous and the wicked, and you better get yourselves ready. That's what was important. The message was all important, you see, and we've got to understand that. We've got to learn that lesson. Well, in the text that we had, we had a contrast between John and Jesus, so it seems fitting to me that we would just look at that next guy there. Jesus is the sinner's friend. In fact, somewhere in the Bible it says that. He's the friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. 
And if you're the kind of person who doesn't think we should be friendly to sinners, you wouldn't have liked Jesus at all. You know, there are some Christians like that. It's sad. It bothers me when I see that. But I see, what are you talking to him for? What are you talking to her for? Why, she's a sinner. She's a drunk. Uh, he did this. He did that. What are you associating with them for? And we act like we're too good to talk to sinner people. What's the matter with us? You see, Jesus went out and mixed it up with the sinners of the world. And if you don't like that kind of thing, you wouldn't have liked Jesus at all. He wouldn't have been your kind of preacher. And think of that. There are a lot of people who didn't like Jesus. That's why he got crucified. Because there are people who did not like him. They did not like the things that he did and the things that he said. Turn your Bibles now to Luke chapter 15, just as an illustration of what I'm saying here. And this is the same kind of, you get the same kind of complaints today. It says in verse 1, then all of the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. Oh, we can't have that. We, we've got to have just righteous people coming to hear Jesus. We can't have any sinners coming to hear Jesus. But they're coming, you see. The tax collectors and the sinners, they're coming. And the Pharisees and the scribes, again, the ostensibly religious people, they complain, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. What kind of preacher is that? What kind of preacher would be nice to sinners? What kind of preacher would be the friend of sinners? Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, He's the one. In fact, Jesus responds in verse 3, He spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? Those ninety-nine will be just fine. I'll leave them right here in the wilderness. Nobody's going to bother me out here. And I'm going to go find that one which was lost. Jesus said, that's what I'm doing when I'm eating with sinners. I'm trying to find that one that's lost. I'm trying to find that one that will respond, that one that will listen. That's what I'm doing here. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And he comes home and he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who, who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Let me read that last verse again. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. How are we going to reach the sinners if we're not going to be the friend of sinners? You're not going to reach them, are you? You got to be like Jesus. You got to be the. But if you're that kind of person, you think you're too good to associate with sinners. You think you're too good to talk to somebody who who's done some wrong things in their life. You're never going to reach anybody, and you're not going to like Jesus. You're not going to like him as a preacher because that's exactly what he did. Not only that, but Jesus was the kind of man who could show compassion to sinners. Sometimes we're a little short on compassion, aren't we? We're short on. We're we're heavy on condemnation and short on compassion. Well, I'm all for condemning sin. You know that. You've heard me preach long enough. You know that. But sometimes we've got to have a little compassion, too. That's got to go with it. Turn with me to John 8. We know the story. The woman caught in adultery. Look at this. Verses 1 through 11. It says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they had set her in the midst. And they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. So they bring, bring her to Jesus. Now Moses and the law commanded that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Now by the way, they're not interested in the truth and the facts here. The old law said that if you catch somebody in adultery, you're supposed to bring them both. And both of them get stoned. Where's the man? They brought the woman. Where's the man? They said she's caught in the very act. Well, where's the man? Where'd he go? Why don't you have him? You see, they're not interested. You can see that in verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down on the ground and wrote with his finger as though he did not hear. In other words, that's what I call a royal ignoring. That's exactly what he did. He's not paying a bit. He just sat down. It's like, I didn't even hear what you said. He's a royal ignoring. So they continued to ask him, and he raised himself up, and he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Don't misconstrue that passage. We all have sin. He's not saying he that is without sin, period. He means in this situation. You've sinned. You didn't bring the man. You caught this woman in the very act of adultery, and you only brought the woman. You've sinned. He's not talking about sin in general. We all have that. But he's saying in this situation, you see. And so he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. 
And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Stop. Neither do I condemn you to death. He didn't say, Neither do I condemn your adultery. And I'm going to prove it to you here in just a second. He didn't say, neither do I condemn your adultery. He says, neither do I condemn you to death penalty. You're not going to be stoned today. Not today. And then Jesus said to her, the rest of verse 11, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There it is. Jesus didn't say, it's okay that you committed adultery. He said, don't do it anymore. He said, repent of it, you see. But he showed compassion, didn't he? He showed some compassion. Sometimes that's a quality we lack. But if you don't like somebody that can show compassion to sinners, you wouldn't have liked Jesus at all because that's what he was all about. But let's turn this around just a minute and think about Jesus a little further. Jesus wasn't a bit bashful about getting angry about sin either. Jesus wasn't all sugar and spice. Sometimes we get that skewed opinion of Jesus. We think he was just all sugar and spice and everything nice. No, sometimes Jesus could get angry. And sometimes Jesus could act on that anger. Turn with me a couple of examples here. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, and I think it's the first six verses I want to look at here. It says, He, Jesus, entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Just think of that for a second. We're, we're going to keep our eye on that preacher. We've got to get something on him. Let's just see if he heals on the Sabbath. Never mind he healed somebody. Never mind he worked a miracle. Never mind this proves he's the Son of God. We just want something to accuse him of. We get, get some little piece of dirt on him, you see. So he said to the man with the withered hand, step forward. And he said to them, to the people, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? Now he's putting them on the spot, but they're not going to answer him. They kept silent. That made Jesus mad. That made Jesus mad. It says, when he looked around at them with anger, the Lord got angry about it. You're not even going to step up to the plate and answer my question. You're not even going to do that. And so he looked at them with anger. He was angry about their sin, about their partiality here, about their conniving. He's angry about it. And he said, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And the Pharisees went out immediately and repented. No, no. They plotted with the Herodians against them how they might destroy him. You see, they're still been on their mission after all of that, after all of that. And so if you don't like somebody who can get angry about sin like Jesus does, Jesus can get angry about sin. Jesus can show compassion to the sinner. By the way, notice that. You hate the sin, but you love the sinner. We say that often. But think of the impact of that. Think of the implication of that. Jesus is the living example of that. He hates the sin, but he certainly loves the sinner. So much so that he would die for them. So much so that he would give their life. Consider another example of the anger of Jesus in John chapter 2. When Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers. John chapter 2 verses 13 and following. It says, when the Passover of the Jews was at hand, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. By the way, under the law of Moses, this was perfectly acceptable to, to change. Uh, you can read about, I think it's uh, Leviticus 14 or maybe Numbers 14. I can't remember off the top of my head. But they could sell their stock. They could travel to Jerusalem. They could buy stock and offer it in the temple. That was in the law of Moses. The problem wasn't that they were doing business. The problem was they were doing business in the temple. That was the problem in God's holy house, you see. And so he found them doing business in the temple. And he made a whip of cords. What? Jesus? The friend of sinners? Yep. He made a whip of cords. And by the way, I've, I've made this point before, but I got this feeling. We see all these paintings of Jesus, and he's always this scrawny little wimp. I don't think Jesus was a scrawny little wimp. Jesus was a carpenter, and he worked in wood. And Jesus probably was pretty buff. Jesus probably had some muscles on him, you see. And so when Jesus cracks the whip, that got their attention. You see, they start running. They start heading for the hills. And Jesus, one man, think of that. This is one man. And he's taking on this multitude in the temple, and he starts cracking the whip. That got their attention really in a hurry, you see. And so he fashioned a scourge of cords, and he drove them out of the temple. Now, it doesn't ever say he ever struck a single person, but he sure got their attention, didn't he? He turns over the tables, he starts cracking the whip, and they're heading out. They're heading for the hills. And he, and he cast them all out with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overturned their tables. And he said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise, which confirms what I said before. 
it wasn't that they were doing business. It was that they were doing business in the temple. But Jesus could get angry about sin. And so if you don't like the kind of preacher who can get angry about sin, trust me, you would not have liked Jesus at all. Now think about that for just a second. Because you're going to have people coming in here. And, and if he expresses some anger about sin, if, if he's compassionate towards sinners, how are you going to react to that? Because how, that's exactly how you'd react to Jesus. That's what I want you to see. We, we get focused on the here and the now. We forget, you know, there were people in the Bible who were different. There were preachers in the Bible. You got John out there in the wilderness uh, dressed like a hermit, and you got Jesus in town, the sinner's friend. Two different men, exactly the same message. Both God's messengers, two different men. And the point is, again, the man behind the message might be an unappealing person to you, but God loves him. And God's using him. Think about that for a second. The message is what's important, not the man behind the message. We've got to learn that lesson. It's a great, great lesson for us. And those were the two examples we saw in our text, but I want to bring out two more. Here's, here's one for you. How about the uneducated hypocrite? The uneducated hypocrite. That's the Apostle Peter. Now, we, we talk about Peter in very glowing terms, and we should. Don't misunderstand me. We should. Jesus, uh, Peter was an apostle of the Lord. And he did a lot of great work. And he opened the kingdom to the Jews in Acts 2. And he opened the kingdom to the Gentiles in Acts 10. But we forget sometimes the real Peter. Peter was the uneducated hypocrite. Now, let's take those one at a time. Let's talk about the uneducated. If you're the kind of person who only likes polished speakers, how'd I last for 16 years? <laughs> if you're the kind of person who only likes polished speakers, listen, you would not have liked Peter at all. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 4 and look at this with me. Acts chapter 4, and I think it's verse 13. This is in the earliest days of the church, and, and people are, are reacting to these apostles. And in verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they're boldly preaching the gospel, they're boldly standing up to the Jewish authorities. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, and untrained men. You know, Peter was just a fisherman. That's all he was. He didn't go to college. Peter didn't go to college. Peter didn't have a degree. Peter wasn't highly educated. He's just a fisherman, just a common fisherman. And so they perceived that they were uneducated men, and they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's where they got this doctrine. They'd been with Jesus. But notice, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. If you're the kind of person who only likes the polished speaker, you wouldn't like Peter at all. You'd have said, well, they let him preach on the day of Pentecost 4. Well, they let him go to the household of Cornelius. He's not very polished. He's uneducated. He's untrained. Why, well, he's just a common fisherman. What's he doing preaching the gospel? What's he doing being an apostle? You wouldn't have liked Peter at all. But we get caught up on the man, don't we? We get caught up on the man instead of the message. In fact, think about Peter. Think about the hypocrite part now. If you're the kind of person who likes to hold a man's past against him, you wouldn't have liked Peter you wouldn't have liked Peter at all. Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 26. And we know the story. Peter denied the Lord three times with an oath and with cursing. Let's read it. Matthew 26, verse 69. And Jesus is on trial. Peter sat outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, You were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them, saying, I don't know what you're saying. Now, Peter's a liar right there. He was with Jesus. He did know Jesus, and he just lied. He just flat out lied. And when he'd gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was with Jesus, but again he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Another lie compounded by an oath, a double lie. I'm not, I don't know him, and I'm swearing on a Bible, so to speak, that I don't know him. And so a double sin. A little later, verse 73, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you're one of them, your speech betrays you. And he began to curse. Now he's adding sin upon sin upon sin. He began to curse. And he, to swear he took an oath again. And then he lied again. I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus who said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. If you, don't, if you would hold a man's past against him, you wouldn't have liked Peter at all. Why does, he get to, why does he get to preach the gospel on Pentecost? He denied the Lord. He denied the Lord three times. He denied the Lord with an oath. 
Why does he get to open up the kingdom to the Jews? Why does he get to open up the kingdom to the Gentiles? Why does he get to be an apostle? You wouldn't have liked Peter at all. If you're, going, if you're the kind of person who holds a man's past against him. You know, if you dig hard enough and say anybody's past, you're going to find something, I guarantee you. You're going to find, we're all sinners, folks. Every last one of us are sinners. We've all done things wrong. We've all said things we shouldn't say. We've all had thoughts we shouldn't have. And you dig far, you're going to find something. And if you're the kind of person who holds a man's past against him, you wouldn't have liked Peter at all. Oh, we can't have that. We can't have him being a preacher. Can't have him preach here. He's a hypocrite. Not only that, but he, he doesn't have a college degree. He didn't go to school. He's just a common fisherman, you see. You wouldn't have liked Peter at all. But again, remember, the man behind the message might be unappealing to you. But this is God's man. This is God's messenger. And he's preaching the message of God. The message is what matters. The message is what's important. Now, Let's take that hypocrite thing just a little further further. Sometimes people say, well, I don't go worship with hypocrites. Again, you wouldn't have liked Peter. Turn over to Galatians chapter 2. Look at these verses. Galatians 2. Verses 11 and following. And Paul is telling the story. We'll talk about Paul in a minute. When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Paul stood up to Peter because he was to be blamed. He did the wrong thing. What did he do, Paul? Well, before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. That was the right thing. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews, because this is Peter and this is an apostle and he carries weight and he carries influence, so the rest of the Jews also played the what? The hypocrite with him. So that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. That, that little phrase, even Barnabas, that's like a shock. I can't believe even Barnabas? You mean even Barnabas got caught up in that? Yeah, he did. He got caught up in that. We can't have that, you see. And so Paul, he says, when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? You're being a hypocrite. And so again, if you're going to hold a man's past against him, Peter did a lot of stuff, didn't he? He cut off the servant of the high priest's ear with a sword. He denied Jesus three times with an oath. He played the hypocrite here at Antioch. Peter did a lot. Well, I can't, we can't have a man like that preaching. Look at all the mistakes he's made in his life. Be careful when you start talking like that because you've made them too. Be very careful. The man behind the message. Don't get caught up on the man. Think about the message. The message is what matters. Is it the truth? Is it the gospel? That's what really matters, not the person, not the man, you see. This reminds me, by the way, of an old friend of mine. I won't call his name because he is a friend. But he made some terrible mistakes in his younger days. He had two children out of wedlock. Surely did. And he's, but, you know, to his credit, he's raising those children. And that man decided he wanted to preach. And he had a little trouble because there were churches just like this. I don't want a man like that preaching for us. But I've watched this man grow and I've watched this man develop and he's become a fine man. And you see, this is what happens. This is what we've got to understand. We all need some therapy. We all need some fixing. We all can do better. And my friend is doing better. My friend is preaching the gospel. Yeah, he had two children out of wedlock, but he raised them up. And he raised them up all by his lonesome. And, and I, want you to, I want you to think about that. I want you to give, give people a chance. Don't hold their past against them. As if you do, you would never would have heard preacher Peter preach. Nope, can't have Peter because he did all those things in the past. Well, let's turn this around. Now let's talk about the educated nerd. <laughs> the educated nerd, that would be the Apostle Paul. You know, there are people out there who think, well, educated men are too stuffy for me. Too stuffy for me. Well, if educated people are too stuffy for you, you wouldn't have liked Paul at all. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. First three verses here. And Paul is giving his defense uh, before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God. As you all, there's an educated man right there. 
There's an educated man right there. And here's a man who's brought up, first of all, in Tarsus. Tarsus was a center of Greek learning, rivaling Athens, rivaling Alexandria. Tarsus was a center of Greek learning. You went there, people who lived there were educated, you see. So look, think about where he was brought up. And then he says, I was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. You couldn't have had a better teacher. You couldn't have had a better teacher than to be raised up by Gamaliel. He had the respect of all the Jewish people. He was highly regarded. So this is a highly educated man. Paul is a highly educated man. And so if educated people are too stuffy for you, you wouldn't have liked the Apostle Paul. Because he was educated. What a contrast between Paul and Peter. Look at the difference. You see what I'm getting? Every preacher is different. Every preacher is different because we're all human beings. We're all individuals. We're not clones. We're not rubber stamps of one another. We're all individuals. Every preacher is different. And if you, if you think educated men are a little bit too stuffy for you, you wouldn't like Paul. Which one would you like? Would you rather have Paul or rather have Peter? That could split a church, couldn't it? <laughs> that could split a church if you get to thinking about it. And here's another thing. This educated man made a conscious decision about his preaching. For, turn to 1 Corinthians 2. He made a conscious decision about his preaching. So, in other words, it's not that Paul couldn't have delivered real stuffy sermons, but he chose not to. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the, he, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. And I, brethren, verse 1, when I came to you, to Corinth, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, he could have, couldn't he? We've already established the fact that he was an educated man, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. He could have. He could have really given him the stuffy stuff. He says, but, verse 2, I determined. Stop. I made a conscious decision. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. A simple message. I'm just going to focus on Jesus. I'm just going to talk about the Lord Jesus. I'm going to talk about His cross. I'm going to talk about what He did for us. I'm just going to focus on that, you see. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, although He could have. Remember that. He was educated. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. Isn't that my main point right there? Don't focus on the man but focus on the message. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Don't glory in my education. Don't, don't glory in that. I determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Reminds me of my old preaching colleague, Randall, that I used to preach with in Kentucky. He's dead now. He said he went somewhere and held a gospel meeting. And he said every night the local preacher would get up and he'd say, well, that was a simple lesson. And he'd sit down. Randall said, I had a crawl full of that by Friday. <laughs> he said, I got up and he said, I'll tell you all something. He said, I, ha I have taken pride in the fact that I'm just a simple country preacher. People can understand what I'm saying. They get the message. They understand it. And so Randall, he just kind of, he kind of set that guy straight. He set that guy back in place, you see. And, and we have to understand now, if you're going to hold simple preaching in contempt, you wouldn't have liked Paul. Because Paul was educated, but he chose to focus on the simple. He chose to focus. Uh, to me, that's the challenge of preaching, by the way, if you ask me. You take all these complex topics in the Bible and make it simple for the folks. That's what preachers do. That's what it's about. Taking the complex themes of the Bible and make it simple for the folks. And so if you hold that kind of thing in contempt, you wouldn't have liked the Apostle Paul. Not at all. If you judge a man by his physical appearance, you wouldn't have liked Paul. Turn with me. You've heard me preach this before. 2 Corinthians 10. Paul wasn't the prettiest fellow in the world. Says the, says the second unprettiest person standing in the pulpit up here. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 10, verses 7 and following. Paul says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? You just focused on what the guy looks like. Is that, is that what this is about? If anyone's convinced that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, now they're making, a, this is their commentary on Paul. This is their commentary on the educated nerd. His letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. He's a good writer. He writes some very weighty and powerful stuff, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. You're ugly. 
and you don't talk very well. <laughs> tradition tells us, I don't know if it's true, but this, this doesn't come from Scripture, but tradition that tells us the Apostle Paul was short and bow-legged and bald-headed. Sorry, Brother Randy. And had a unibrow, you know, where it just goes straight across. And the point I'm making is, he, he, he wasn't necessarily the most appealing man in the world. You know, he, he, he wasn't Sylvester Stallone or whoever your ideal of a guy is. He, he wasn't that. His, his bodily presence was weak. His speech was contemptible. But that's not what matters, is it? That's not what matters. And so if you judge a man by his physical appearance, you wouldn't have liked the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't have liked him at all. And so as we wind this thing up, I want you to think about this. The hidden lesson behind all of this is, a, this is one of those twofers. There's a hidden lesson here. How we judge people today, I'm talking specifically about preachers, but it can be expanded to others. How we judge preachers today may just be a reflection of how we would have looked at John or Jesus or Peter or Paul. You ever thought about that? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we're going to go down toward the end of the chapter, verse 53 and following. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there, and he came to his own country, and he taught them in their synagogue, and they were astonished. And they said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they were offended at him. They were offended at Jesus. Because he wasn't their kind of preacher. He's just a carpenter's son. We know his family. They live right here. And Jesus says, I like his response, A prophet is not without honor. He does have honor. But he's not without honor except among his own country and in his own house. Sometimes in, in, that, in this context here, his own house is the church. <laughs> Sometimes... Brethren can be pretty harsh on preachers. Think about that. Because the, really the, the important thing is not the man, but the message. Is the message true? Is the message tracking with the Word of God? That's what's really important. And you think about that when you're looking for your next preacher. That's what matters. The message. That's the all-important thing. Not what he looks like. Not how educated he is. Not how polished he is. Not what he eats. Not how he dresses. But the message. Hope that lesson will help you out a little bit. If you're here this morning and are not a Christian, we want you to know that the Lord Jesus came into this world to die on the cross for your sins and for mine, for all of our sins. I have said several times throughout this lesson, we're all sinners, and we are. And were it not for that wonderful sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross, every single one of us would be hellbound. That's just the truth. That's just the facts. So thank God for Jesus. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, Jesus wants to save you too. Believe in Him as the Son of God. Believe that He died for your sins. Believe that He rose from the grave and that He sits at the right hand of God as King. Repent of your sins. You can't keep living in sin and go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Repent of your sins. Confess that faith and be baptized. Right behind me is the baptistry filled with warm, clean water, ready to go. We don't even have to go to the creek or to the lake. We can do it right here. And if you're subject to the invitation, won't you come now while we stand and sing?